Okay. I'm getting this message that I'm being recorded, but that's fine. Anyway, regretting to restore drained peatlands and paludiculture culture or other related agricultural practices can be financed and supported under the cap payments for you for eco uh, schemes and rural development funding. But let's take a step back to look at the bigger picture. You know, we have figures that tell us that it's estimated that 3% of the EU's agricultural area is made of carbon rich soils, of drained peatland. And this 3% is responsible for 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions of the agricultural sector. So, this is a pretty obvious message for the need to restore re uh, drained peatlands under agricultural land. And these restoration efforts would have a big effect on, on, on climate mitigation. So there are already some programs at the Commission to address peatland restoration. But this brings me a little bit to the future as well, and our planned nature restoration rule, which is currently planned to be adopted, adopted uh, uh, towards the end of June, still to be confirmed. So I can outline a little bit about that prior to what we can really say. Once it's really adopted, then we can tell everybody much more. But at the core, the core objective is to restore degraded ecosystems, particularly those with the high potential to sequester and store carbon naturally, and those best suited to prevent uh, and reduce the impact of natural disasters. So we're aiming at an overarching over objective as a set of very specific targets and obligations for specific ecosystems. And this should cover quite a broad range of ecosystems in the EU um, that need to be restored. And these could include forests, wetlands, peatlands, agroecosystems, coastal ecosystems, marine ecosystems, and even urban ecosystems, and as well as some specific species types. So we are considering some quantified binding targets related to the habitats directive and its own habitats. And that would cover around 25% of the EU area, terrestrial area. And we're also considering a set of obligations, you know, specific, you can't really call them targets, but obligations to increase certain indicators, like on pollinators, on forests or agroecosystems such as butterfly populations, presence of deadwood in forests. And the obligation there is not so much to set an area-based target, but rather to have an improving trend uh, with certain indicators. So we have this kind of multiple-pronged approach, some area-based things, and for which condition is defined, because a condition is already defined for the Annex 1 Habitats Directive uh, areas. Uh, through the, the favorable conservation standards. And, and then apart from that, so not some increase in indicators that would show and give evidence of improvement in biodiversity. So these targets consider quite a, a broad range of things. And this part of this multiple pronged uh, approach also takes account, in a sense, some of the time scales needed for restoration. And that can be very different for different ecosystems. And so putting in measures is one approach, uh, and but putting having out ecological outcomes is another approach and a way of checking the progress has been made. So we aim to have uh, such a, a suite of, of targets and obligations. And to make things happen, we, we are thinking very much about having a national restoration plans that would be the kind of enabling measures so that member states would then describe in plans in detail how they would arrive at these targets. And this approach is very much based on the principle of subsidiarity since a lot of restoration, all restoration activity has to be carried out at very national re or regional or even very specific local levels. And so through these plans, member states would decide where to put the restoration measures in place, and just as a backdrop on the international scene, with such a new law, the EU can contribute to the global 
UN Global Biodiversity Framework and the Conference of the Parties, which is due to be held next year and for which preliminary discussions are taking place, uh, and for which global objectives of, of uh, uh, addressing both restoration and halting the loss of biodiversity are one of the very big themes. And so we are hoping that if we come out with this proposal before the summer, that would be good timing also to be able to put it on the ground. So that's practically what we are aiming to do. In the, in the so our, our hope is that reversing the decline of biodiversity, restoring ecosystems, should contribute to the EU's overall resilience to withstand such shocks such as climate change, disaster risk reduction, and helping better ensure food supply. Sorry, apart, could you speak up? Could you speak apart, up again? Apart from addressing specific objectives, ecological objectives of definitely trying to uh, hold the loss of biodiversity and reverse that. So basically, um, that's about the end of my presentation. And so we believe that the nature restoration law is going to be an important investment for, for, for environmental policy at EU level in the future. And we look forward to your support of various practitioners and scientists in the area, particularly in wetlands and peatland restoration, to further support us in the various negotiation and implementation phases that are coming. Thank you very much. I hope you could hear a bit, at least some of that. Well, thank you, Jakub. And um, well, uh, the nature restoration law would definitely help us in, uh, in our work. And we look forward to its publication uh, later in June. Um, our next speaker is uh, Rudy van Degelen. Um, Rudy is a vegetation ecology expert at Antwerp University, uh, where he joined in 2008 and has conducted research in the domain of ecology and nature management uh, with special emphasis on restoration ecology. He's one of the founders of the landscape eco hydraulical systems, uh, eco hydrological system analysis LISA, a standard impact assessment procedure in the Netherlands and Flanders. Uh, Rudy, could you uh, join us up here? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was afraid you were going to read all. Oh. <laughs> okay, can I use it? Which one? Okay. You hear me? Yes. Okay. I hope you enjoyed it here like I did. It was a bit of a rush to come here, but nevertheless, I think it was very much worthwhile to be here. Um, what we did here today is that we exchange knowledge with each other, change experience with each other, uh, scientific information. Um, without that, we cannot do our work. We cannot do the practical work. Um, I do not agree with the people who say that we know most of the science and now we do something. I've heard it my whole life. Give an indication. I am 35 years active in ecological restoration. I heard from the beginning that we know now enough and now should do something. I've seen things changing completely in the 35 years, mainly steered by developments in, in knowledge. So I think that's it's a worthwhile uh, goal to pursue. Uh, it would be a pity that all the knowledge that we have gained here and now during this, uh, this, this CAPIT um, project, that it would go, well, not go up in smoke, but that it would be disseminated somewhere in the cloud, to put it that way. We have a lot of, a lot of, lot of, lot of knowledge generating power together, and it would be very much helpful to keep, to keep that, 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 that power together. And it was also foreseen in the, uh, in the application, I can, well, you can read, so I'm not going to read that for you. But what it essentially says is that the research partners will take an initiative to come to some kind of body, whatever you wish to call it, for knowledge exchange. Uh, how was it? This one then. No, even that doesn't work. 
Oh yeah, there it is. <clears throat> so what it is, is continuation of the cooperation regarding knowledge exchange after the ending of the project. Now I've done such things before in, in other, in other um, Grimia. What I learned there is that saying that is one thing, doing it is another thing. And for doing it, you need a structure. Without the structure, you'll just be a loose uh, group of people, and which typically have the tendency that many people will, will fall away during the during the, the upcoming time. Everybody, of course, has good intentions, but there is not is not a structure. So there must be some kind of structure. Otherwise, it simply doesn't work. What I learned as well is don't try to do something what somebody else already does. Because uh, the only thing what, what will come then is that you will, <coughs> you will uh, create two competing groups. And that may be highly feasible in political conditions. And they may think it's very worthwhile. In reality, it means you spend most of your time competing with each other instead of spending that time on, on, on cooperation. So it means, essentially, in my opinion, that you need structure and you need a group that has its own niche and cooperates with all the existing groups in there. Well, I think, <clears throat> and I mentioned here a few, there are of course many, many more. We, more, we heard several during this conference, IMCG, Minor Conservation Group, Wetlands International, you can peatland programs, a temporary program, which is now so, so long temporary, it's almost institutional, uh, Society of Ecological Restoration, et etc. et cetera. I think the, the niche of, the group on CarePeat is uh, the combination of knowledge creation directly in direct combination with the, uh, with the, how do you call it, the people sharing, people using this knowledge, the, 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 the nature managers. I think that's a strong, the strong thing of, 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 of CarePeat. So, basing upon that, I have written up some, some ideas. They are totally open to debate. Everybody who wants to discuss it, it's totally open. I have not exchanged this with, with anybody from, from CarePeat simply because I was asked to do this about two weeks, three weeks ago, maybe. <laughs> so, well, it was mainly due to my schedule. I was not available for the time, so it's easy. It's not their fault. Uh, but <clears throat> I think there are a few practical things that need to be done. One of the practical things is the knowledge that needs to be disseminated. That means it has to be published. Not only have here a nice conference that we tell each other how well, how well we did a lot of things, but it needs to be published. It needs to be published both in scientific journals and it needs to be published in, uh, in, 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 in things like leaflets and, and, and this type of thing. That's obviously a task for the, um, for the individual individuals working on a specific task. Um, what you can do as some kind of science working group or whatever you wish to call it, is that you can, can, prov can provide some kind of discussion board or things like what I call friendly reviewers. Those of you who are active in science know how hard the competition is. And especially for, um, for younger people just starting, it simply means your, your, your paper is shot to pieces if there's only a very minimal error in it, uh, simply because the competition is so severe. So then the group giving friendly, uh, friendly reviews is worth one. What would be a nice thing, but for the somewhat longer term, I think, but we'll discuss about that later, is to produce overviews of the knowledge from this to, and to produce, well, what you could call white papers or something like, uh, like that, preferably together with other organizations. Because if we do it, it will say, well, uh, this is uh, 40 people or 80 people, 150 or whatever, uh, that does not count against the uh, 500,000 people who are member of, well, whatever it is. So another thing is advise practical partners in and possibly also outside Eurostar, Eurostar. We have gathered knowledge, what is it? Knowledge needs to be used. If you don't use it, it's worth of knowledge. Um, the idea was also to develop lectures to also, again, knowledge dissemination, develop lectures about peatland restoration. It can be online lectures, can be uh, recorded lectures, it can be anything. 
several of you probably do that. I do it as well anyway. I, I'm sure that several of you do that. You can do that. Well, for instance, to give you an example, a few years ago, I exchanged some of my lectures with, with some colleagues in, uh, in Germany. And I now give some lectures on restoration on a topic that I'm not specifically familiar with, uh, based on, on uh, what is the MBI in mind, but uh, based on, on these type of lectures. And the same is true there. They give lectures, for instance, on people and restoration that I do, things like that. There are two things which are, I think, fundamental. One thing is very nice to say, we want to cooperate with people. I heard it also during this conference several times. People are supporting us, voluntary scientists are supporting us, voluntary, helping us, voluntary, whatever. This is, of course, nonsense. They also have to leave. Somebody funds these scientists. Those of you who are not in science have no idea how difficult it is to get funding. <clears throat> I work now in I work now in the third university during my life, and they all had the same the same problem, and I see that everywhere. We have a very small staff, and all the rest works on fun. So the only thing we do is hunting for fun. And such group could help, not hunting for funding per se for us, but hunting for funding for peatland research. If you don't do that, your project is dead. There is no prospect. If you don't have money, there is no prospect. But that's an important thing. We could work together. I mentioned some potential finances, but of course, many other ones. Another thing, a very practical thing, which I think would be a good first task for such working group, is to prepare the scientific content of the next and probably the last, I think, the final conference of, uh, of CARE. If I'm well informed, and if it's not right, you correct me. Uh, if I'm well informed, there will be a conference next year as the final conference of CARE, probably in Belgium, I think. In May. May is already determined. Okay. Um, I think a good task for <coughs> such a group would be to help structuring, help preparing such the scientific content of such, uh, of such a conference. Maybe not the, uh, not the organizational stuff, but certainly the scientific content. And to give it somewhat more impact, we could also consider, but that's maybe <coughs> something not now, but pretty soon, to involve also other people, because otherwise we will have a, well, a relatively small, uh, how you say that a uh, small group of people working on it. Of course, it, it may look nice to 300 people, but if that is all, uh, it would be wise, in my opinion, to involve other people as well. But of course, it means that means also more organization. But anyway, I think that's a, a, a clear and also a reachable target for uh, for for an overseeable time. Okay, um, these are some things that I thought of. I think. The last two are highly important, and the, the, the one uh, where the others are important should, 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 should uh, say continue <coughs> all along the line. Like I said, um, my suggestion would be to have to structure such a working group as a <coughs> working group or whatever you call it via Eurocide. You have to do it via some organization. The Eurocide would be. The obvious organization, in my opinion, in this case, but that, that is also a lot of other people. Anyway, have it via something. I put here the uh, uh, the uh, the email address. I look at Yelk. I could also put your email address there. No, I'm happy that it's general. One. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I put it, put it. I put it there, and I would invite people to. To uh, well, first of all, I would invite you to to discuss what. The things I just told you. And secondly, I would invite you to to send emails, and I'm explicitly also talking to people who are still online to send uh, to send your name and 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 and, and, and uh, how do you call it? Email with the intention that you want to join this uh, this uh, this group. Um, and finally, a very practical thing. Politic and myself were a bit ahead of. Uh, of you all, and we already scheduled an online meeting. 
for 15 June. I put the date before, so keep it open in your agenda. <laughs> and uh, of course, you can look for the other time, and I warn you, my agenda is pretty full. <laughs> so uh, that was more or less my ideas about this. Maybe we can go back, we can go back. How do I do that? Page up? Where is it? Go back to the preview. Yeah, this is about the content. Any reactions would be highly appreciated. Okay. You'll you'll be now. First of all, I wanted to know is this it's a new proposed work to put on the website yeah. for reviews. And there is no wait wait a moment. Not no well, if at the moment it would be on the KRP, but it would be a continuation of KRP. So that is why I suggest to have it on the Euro side. Because there is a different uh, restoration manager on the Euro site already that could be you know, this content could strengthen that previous restoration work group. I'll be happy to combine it. Shared by Paul Richter and uh, in a number of those, which are excellent numbers. Good. Uh, the second thing, I love the content. I think it's really, really pertinent. Um, the Global Peatlands Initiative has a Peatlands Research Working Group, 195 researchers from around the world. And we, for the last uh, year, <coughs> online trainings. So this idea of this best lecture about Peatlands Restoration Standards models, business cases would be something that we'd be also interested in duplicating or reporting. I would say what we don't do well, and that we hopefully learned from this COVID situation is record everything, right? Record it, translate it, put it somewhere that people are going to look at it. And we'd be happy to house that content on um, the virtual business pavilion uh, or our Global Business Initiative YouTube channel. Because I think that, that that as people get more and more capable of um, you know, doing their own little research, they'll find their way to these DIY um, YouTube pieces. So really exciting to see. Uh, we also do, through the Global Peoples Initiative Research Working Group, uh, um, practice-related research proposals that joined up mm -hmm. interdisciplinary. And I think that that's really something that's going to be important for the, for the future, that we uh, prepare projects, proposals, and research funding proposals, I think, explicitly, that are actually interdisciplinary. So the another aim of that global peoples initiative research working group is to get diverse researchers from all parts mm -hmm. of the uh, of research community together. We're really excited about this and see how we can plug it into the efforts that are employed. No, I fully, fully agree with that. Obviously, I cannot stress that enough. The word is cooperation, not competition. Thank you, and thank you, um, thank you for coming up with this idea. Um, I think it's good. Thank you also, Claire, and for talking about the Global Peoples Initiative, because I think that umbrella could work really well to, to have that at least in the links. Um, I think you're aiming for something very big creating knowledge and sharing knowledge. Creating knowledge is good, sharing knowledge, you need to know your audience, you focus on a few audiences. There will be a whole series of audiences beyond the university audience that's the practical people, the implementers of the program. So how are you going to work with those? So I think I think the, the world concept I like. Um, we've also got the Weapons International European Association whereby we're focusing more and more on working in Europe. So we can think about how we can work together with that and use that maybe as a tool to help and facilitate. Uh, I, I'm, I'm 
slightly portion allows the width of what you <coughs> are proposing. This is quite light and quite all inclusive. Might help to make it more focused. <laughs> I fully agree with it. And that is why that is why I put it here on the table. And what I say, it is a work in uh, in develop in development. Obviously, there is uh, there is the expectation by the funders that such a work will be will be That is part actually part of the proposal. Um, obviously, also I already uh, said it. There should be cooperation. On the other hand, I must uh, I must conclude that what I am uh, in, in doing practical work, whether I'm talking to practical people, much of the knowledge that we and with we and the scientific community are being goes through to the to the to the public. So that is that is very clear. And if you're talking about the audience, well, it's not uh, not by uh, by accident that it would be on site in here. And your side is the, is the umbrella organization of the nature conservation organization. I think that is the first first audience to put his knowledge, uh, this knowledge to. Yeah, yeah, I, I see you, I see you thinking. I agree with you on a personal level, but on a personal level, I, I, I think there might be much more, uh, much more emphasis on wider human nature. Uh, given the organization that we're in now, I think it's already in a very decent target to, to come to, uh, to, to disseminate the knowledge that is in this room, so to, uh, so to, to, the, to the managers on the floor. I've seen in my life we probably as well. I've seen many, many restoration attempts that were very good intended and actually analyzed the problem. And it's not because the people are stupid, but it's because the knowledge does not reach these people. So I think there is, there is, um, how do you call it, a niche, a niche, a niche, to channel the knowledge that is available for me, to channel it to, uh, to, the, to the people who are doing practical restoration work. And I'm not talking about people on the, on the, on the track, but I'm talking about people who make the plans. Come, people, you see, like you, you look like you see what good. Um, I have one of the two people driving around system all pilot uh, uh, sites in the world countries. I mean, I have uh, just to share this knowledge. Well, I do it is on my own money, so it's not strange uh, to uh, see uh, the projects at the end. I work with Women's International also on a project that uh, discussing fund, and uh, I'm not being paid, but I would have been paid in the second round. But the second round didn't materialize, and the uh, first round we stopped when the hours are counted and it's actually low. So um, I don't know if you get everyone in the system. No, I fully, I fully agree with you. I try, but what we try to do is to make the circle wide because what you say is exactly the same situation for many of us, including myself. And I play part in it, I'll put it that way. Uh, and that's probably true for many, uh, many of us. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I think if you don't try it, you will never, you will never get. It. I mean, you, you, you are probably a part, I don't know your financial situation, but I guess your private one is uh, ending. So, uh, so you can, you need a medium to disseminate. And on the other hand, the high end organizations like UNEP, etc., etc., need to reach the floor. And I see our position somewhere in the middle between. Obviously, we do not want to become a small unit or something like an office. Uh, but you need something to, to, to translate the knowledge to the people who make 
place. But that is somewhere where I see my position of such of such work. Does that mean? Of course, that people see it different. Uh, you know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm supposed not to talk too long. I've been told by Mr. Chairman. Maybe some last final remark from somebody. Yes. I would say that any results or any documentation um, of the working group, however that is constituted as in, in the add-on to the existing treatments uh, restoration working group, would be really important then to also link it up uh, to the UN Economic Assistance Restoration. That is also, you know, growing and, and uh, expanding of knowledge where people through the next 10 years at least are going to be drawn to it. And um, the global peatland initiative team within UNEP has secured a peatland staff in there. So as the uh, content, even if there's a project actually, project uh, database where you can register your peatland restoration or other ecosystem restoration action so that it builds this global database and uh, if the you know this this group would also make that concerted effort because it's, it's not easy it, it takes time to actually fill in and capture all the data but that's all the content and data that um, globally people need for decisions to be made and for progress to be also charted so I would just encourage that, um, make sure that all the results that you're, you're achieving are so important, then feed up and out and downward as much as possible. And certainly social media is a great uh, channel for that. So let's not be shy about this. Couldn't have better myself. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice. And uh, thank all the speakers today. Uh, we're, we need to wrap up. We're, we're well over, over our time. Uh, the idea was to have a session at the end where we can reflect on some of the posing questions that have been asked uh, in the previous sessions. And I think we've, we were so excited putting together this conference with all the great speakers that were uh, coming that we, we might have overbooked all of ourselves. So we've had. Uh, not enough time to reflect and, and uh, go over some of these topics that have been addressed, in particular, the proposal for, for a scientific working group. But I think we can all agree that despite a lot of the decades of research and understanding that we all have, there's still a lot more to be done, uh, especially with, with having the public understand the importance of peatlands and, and the benefit of restored peatlands. Um, if you ask them today, what, how, you know, how do we reduce our carbon footprint? And the, one of the first things they've come up with is to plant trees, right? We know that, yeah, that's great, but we really want to focus on that. We need to start the peatlands and that needs to disseminate. And I think the main point I think is, is it's, it does need to be a cooperation. And I've seen that synergies and cooperation and working together has been such a common theme over the last, both today and yesterday, uh, talking about a global or a European peatlands initiative. So all these efforts are really about synergizing these groups and taking the momentum that peatland is, has now and, and using that, uh, taking that essentially that wave and, and really making the most out of it because these peatlands really are uh, having their moment. And, and I think we, we need to embrace that and enjoy the fact that it's, it's, it is finally here, but it is here. And, uh, but more work needs to be done. Uh, so I am sure I am uh, conscientious of, of time is nearly six. Uh, so what I would recommend is that we take some of these thoughts and questions that we've been burning to ask and apologies to those online. And we take them out to 
uh, the foyer and then uh, half past six, we do need to start meandering uh, down along the canal uh, towards the boat. And feel free to ask all the questions you like over uh, a glass or two. Neil, final I, words. I have one final word. Um, there's a lot of people been involved in this conference and done amazing work. And I'm not going to name too many names, but I do want to name one name. And that's Mr. Terry Morley, because he has put so much of his heart and soul into this. And I think he deserves a huge round of applause. Okay, enough of that. Let's uh, let's break and enjoy enjoy the boat trip. Thank you.